to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we are talking about last minute tips for the MPT or performance test. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We are here to demystify the Bar Exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk through some last minute tips for the performance test. So if you're taking the UBE exam, there are two performance tests as part of your exam. And other states also have a really similar 90 minute performance test, although it's not technically the MPT like California and Pennsylvania. So, you know, depending on how you've been studying, you might feel ready for this part. You might feel worried. You might feel like you don't have enough time to prepare. So today we're going to share some last minute tips to help you squeeze out as many points as you can from the performance test. So Lee, let's first talk about the different types of tasks you might Absolutely, be faced with. Because the PT is my favorite part of the test because you need to know no law. Yeah, this was basically probably why I passed the exam. Yeah. So For, it's, yeah. It's, At that point, you even got two in California. So. I know. So good. I know they stole that away from us they in really California. They really did. I think they made the exam harder <laughs> for people who are good writers. Yeah, I think that that's true. But I think the performance test, although it can seem a little bit overwhelming for folks, is a opportunity to gain points because you don't have the barrier um, of passing, which is, well, you don't have the barrier that you need to know all this very specific law. Right. You don't need to know anything. You don't need to know anything. You just need to know how to do these um, questions. So if you're in a position where you're kind of scrambling and it's at the end of your bar study and you haven't looked at the PTs, carve out some time. It's totally worth it. Yeah, I think sometimes people overlook this to their detriment. You know, they think, oh, well, like you just said, you don't have to know anything. I'll just totally go mm-hmm. in and, you know, I'll be fine. But I do think you, at a minimum, want to at least understand what you're getting into. You want to understand what these look like. You know, you want to understand what you're going to be getting and what they're going to ask you to do. You probably want to read some of them. I mean, ideally, you want to take some. Mm -hmm. But I think definitely people want to prepare for the different types of things. Because, you know, we see some common issues here. Like people run out of time. They're not organized. They don't understand, like, kind of how to do this reading quickly and then figure out what they're going to write about. Um, So a lot of these problems can be solved if you've done a few, you have a plan, you understand what you're going to be asked to do so that you're not wasting time. I think that's the biggest problem on the MPT. I agree. And disorganization. Yes. All right. So now back to the three, uh, well, the four types of uh, MPTs or performance tests. So the first one is the most common for the MPT, which is part of the UBE and also a lot of jurisdictions just use the MPT. Um, It is really just writing a memo to a supervising attorney and you're doing it in an objective tone yeah so this is the most common thing you're going to see yep so you know you get your thing they ask you you know you are a young associate you have been asked to address this question please write this yep i think the one thing that people often overlook is this important note about the tone so if you're writing to your supervising attorney trying to say which outcome is going to you know, happen based on your analysis, you're usually using an objective tone and they want to see that. They don't want this to be a stand on your soapbox um, persuasive argument because that's not what they're calling for. They'll give you that opportunity in a brief, which we'll talk about next. (laughs) Yeah. So basically the first thing I think you've got to establish on any of these is what tone are you being asked for? What's your role? Mm -hmm. Are you being asked to provide an objective analysis, meaning that you're just going to consider both sides and maybe make, you know, your best assessment of what's likely to happen? Or are you being asked to do something persuasive where you're going to pick a side and really make your strongest arguments? Because those are very different. If you do the wrong one, you're not doing what the graders asked you to do. Exactly. So first you want to think about, you know, is your answer organized? Because that is a huge part of this is just following the directions and organizing it and making it a clean and professional answer. Right. I mean, you've sometimes said you want it to be wearing a suit, not sweatpants. Exactly. Even though I love a good pair of sweatpants. Right. But not on the bar (laughs) exam exam. and not in court and not if you're presenting something to a supervising attorney. So you can imagine yourself going into this office and presenting this to someone who's supervising you. That is the tone you need to be taking. Yeah. And I think, you know, your point about following the directions, that is the absolute most critical piece of this entire situation. Mm Mm-hmm. 
if you want to pass the MPT or the, any type of performance test, follow the directions exactly. Yeah. And so oftentimes what they will do, even on a memo, is they might give you specific drafting guidelines or templates. But usually memos don't. But what they often will say is do not spend time giving a statement of facts or restating the facts. So don't talk about the facts if they don't tell you to. Now, I think that we didn't need to talk about this, but I have seen a ton of failing answers on the performance test where people wrote a statement of facts when it was they were told not to. Yeah, and you ask them, why did you do this? Oh, well, I just thought that, you know, that's what you put in a memo. It's like, did you read the instructions? Yeah, they will not give you points for it. They might take some away because you didn't follow the directions. Well, and most importantly, you don't have time for that, right? You know, that 10 minutes or whatever you spent restating the facts is completely wasted time. And you've only got 45 minutes basically to write your answer. Yep. So you just lost almost a quarter of that. Yep, exactly. So, Allison, what is a kind of default organization that um, – folks should have in their pocket if they need to figure out how to just organize on the fly a memo? Well, I mean, I think you want to think about the memos you've seen in your life. And if you've never seen any, you probably want to go look at some. If you've never worked at a law, you know, practice of Mm -hmm. any type, you know, it needs a to, from, date, regarding. All of those should be on a separate line. Typically, you're going to want some type of introduction. You state the question that was asked, your conclusion, you briefly explain the rationale. You know, you want to be thinking, if you're thinking of real life scenarios, how are you going to make it easy for the person who's reading this, who's very busy to understand your work? Same thing for the bar graders. And then you want a discussion. Um, you know, so depending on your jurisdiction, people might recommend you IRAC. They might recommend that you CRAC or whatever that is, where you do your conclusion. CREAC. CREAC. Yeah, I'm not really sure. But, um, <laughs> you know, basically that just means you draw your conclusion first so that it's right up front. Um so, you know, there are varying schools of thought on this. You probably want to do a little bit of investigation, kind of look into what's accepted in your jurisdiction. And then you want to make sure you're separating your issues, your sub-issues, you're using headings, you're using subheadings, um, just to make it easy to follow your logic, because that is the goal here. Yep. So um, just for people who may not be familiar with it, the CREAC is conclusion, rule, explanation, analysis, conclusion, instead of IRAC, which is issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. So usually for UBE jurisdictions, we recommend you follow the CREAC for each issue. But in California, you generally uh, will follow the IRAC unless it's a persuasive memo. So there you go. Yeah, and sometimes in practice, you'll hear these referred to as like speaking headers. Um, Mm -hmm. So you know your header basically makes the argument. So you see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And briefs are submitted to the court, you know. Instead of just stating what the issue is, you actually you know, state your best argument, basically. Yeah, that's so that a good point. when the judge is skimming, they see at least what argument you're trying to make without having to read all of your background. Well, that's a good segue into our next type of PT, which is a brief. Great. What's a brief? <laughs> so a brief is the second most popular performance test, and it's usually addressed to a judge and written to convince the judge to rule in your client's favor. So objective or persuasive? Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to go with persuasive. Persuasive. I'm trying to persuade someone. (laughs) Yes. Which means that it should look different than the objective one. The tone should be different and you should be arguing, you know, for your side. Right. Which doesn't mean you neglect counter arguments. It just means you put a different spin on things. Right. Rather than just laying out, you know, here is the argument for point A on this side. Here's the argument for point B. I think it's most likely to go this direction, which is what an objective memo would be. Yeah. You know, persuasive is more like. Or, you know, argument A should win because of, oh, and by the way, I'm going to address these counter arguments. Right. So things to think about with a brief, um, they're going to give you directions of how to put the brief together. So again, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you have to follow the directions. Yeah, this I mean, is this like is not negotiable science. Yeah, no, you got to do it. Um, and you, also, I mean, they provided those directions for a reason. And part of that reason is to see who follows them and who doesn't, because that makes it really easy to curve. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it just makes your life easier. Just don't get creative. Just follow, follow the directions. They write them out for you. Um, some of the MPTs will also um, ask you to draft headings in a certain way. And you were mentioning that about like a, kind of this, you were saying speaking headings, talking mm-hmm. headings. Um, but they are going to give you a description of what that heading should look like with an example. And I think this is one of those places where people really get tripped up. Um, but you don't need to overthink it. You just need to do it. So you can draft these effective headings while you're taking notes, even prior to drafting your answer, you know, 
know, as part of your outlining process. Um, I mean, the task memo is probably going to identify your issues. You're going to get the rules from the library. You're going to have the facts coming from the file. All you need to do is piece together um, your headings to help you organize your answer and just communicate to the grader. And if they give you an example, you need to follow it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about doing this as you're taking your notes is a great way to structure it. So you, you need to have a pre-writing outline. <laughs> you cannot mm-hmm. just don't jump into these and try to do it after you've read the entire, you know, all the cases and everything. Like you've got to be keeping track as you go through because ideally you don't really want to be going back into the materials to try to find facts. So, yep. you know, you might envision when you read the task memo, identifying the key issues on a piece of paper. Then as you're going through the rules, you can put your rules underneath each issue that they apply to. If you're getting key facts, you can add those in. And then before you start writing, you want to take a few minutes probably to go ahead and construct those headers based on what you've learned about the rules and what you've seen in the facts. Yeah. And if you can't construct the header, then your outline is probably not complete enough. It's well, a good kind of, it's almost like a mini test. Yeah. To I mean, see if you're yeah, ready to exactly. start writing. I mean, if you don't have the answer at that point to what the issue is, I don't really know how you're, you're not going to find the answer in your writing. Right. Like you need to know the issues and the answers before you start writing. Right. And I think one of the other things to note is that you've got to make Make sure that these headers don't become a huge time waste. I know a lot of people get really tripped up on these headers. So if you're struggling to draft a persuasive heading, just do the best you can because yeah. a weak heading is better than no heading or an incomplete answer because you are trying to craft the most amazing heading ever b- to be seen on a performance test. Right. And if you can't figure one out, you can always write the section and then based on what you've written, go back and revise your header. Right. But just put something down. I think what I've seen happen is that they have this header requirement and then somebody doesn't do the header. They save it till the last minute. No, that's terrible. It's terrible because then if you run out of time, <laughs> you've, got you've got crummy <laughs> headers that don't match the format. It's like, write a mediocre header that matches the format and then go back and spruce it up if you have time. Yeah, exactly. You can write something, write your section, look at it briefly, spend 20 seconds revising it, and then move on to the next section. All right. The next type of um, performance test that we see um, come up pretty often is the letter. Mm, So Those um, are always fun. These are always fun. So the audience and tone, um, you know, that we've been talking about with memos and briefs um, is a bit different for a letter because it depends on who you're writing to. Right. And sometimes that person might not be a lawyer. Right. They might say you're writing to your client. And Mm -hmm. again... You need to have a different tone if you're writing to your client than if you're writing to your boss. Right. So you want to really be on the alert for the description of the recipient, including the level of legal knowledge. I think that's what you were talking about, about if it's a client versus another lawyer, uh, the purpose of the letter. I mean, you might have to write a letter to opposing counsel. Mm -hmm. That would be different than a letter to your client. Hopefully you're going to be nicer to your client. (laughs) One would hope. Um, And, you know, why are you writing this letter? Is it too informed? Is it to protect or is it to persuade? So you're going to need to tailor your tone and style appropriately, and that's part of the task. So don't ignore that part. You're getting graded on that. Right. I mean, sometimes people think like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like, they just want me to talk about whatever I want to talk about. It's like, no, they've given you something to do, and you need to pay attention to that. Right. So now, just like other performance tests, some of these letters do have drafting guidelines, but some don't. So if you don't have a drafting guideline, just make it look like a letter. It's got a salutation, a body. Um, you're going to typically CREAC again. See how many times we can say CREAC <laughs> in this uh, podcast. Each issue or IRAC, if you're in California, um, you want to separate things by subheadings and have a nice little closing. Remember, don't sign it with your name. You got to sign it with True. your applicant. You yeah, they, it they will name. probably tell you that, but people will still screw it up. Yeah, so just use applicant. That's and do not put your applicant number. No, just put applicant. Just put applicant yeah. or the lawyer or whatever. Right, or the role if they've given you whatever. It doesn't matter, and but don't put you, your name. Yeah, and I mean, I think if you haven't worked in a professional setting, you might really not be familiar with kind of the standard letter format, but just go to, you know, get a Word document or something online and just look at what does a standard business letter look mm-hmm. like so that you are familiar with that if it's not something that's ingrained in your brain. Yeah. And again, some folks, um, I think, feel like, why should I put it in a letter format that's, you know, isn't that what I have an assistant for? This isn't why I became a lawyer. But you know what? It doesn't matter. This is part of the task. Just write it in the letter format. Yeah. Don't fight the hype. Don't fight it. <laughs> don't fight it. Just do be, be a sheep. Follow directions. Follow directions. All right, the last and not as popular type of performance test is the wild card, um, which isn't as exciting as the name sounds, but it's a unique document or task which may include a review or 
or a revision of, let's say, a sample document, these can really trip people up. I've also seen some where you write a closing argument, um, you know, d- things that aren't the memo, the oh, yeah, brief the, and the letter. The recent infamous one was the Articles of Incorporation. Mm-hmm. People really lost their mind over yeah. that one. So I think this first thing when you see a wild card is you just have to take a deep breath and stay calm. And I actually would argue that wild card um, PTs are an opportunity if we can look on the bright side, because they have to tell you exactly what to do because they are not going to assume, like with a brief or a memo, that you are familiar with what you're doing. Right, exactly. It's almost easier in a way because once you get past the like panic of, I've never drafted articles of incorporation before, they had to have, I mean, they have to tell you what they are. Right. They have to tell you what they should look like because they don't expect that everyone has drafted these before. Right. So if you can take some deep breaths and get your act together, I think it's an easy way to pick up points if you can just be methodical and follow the directions because they have to tell you how to do it or else these answers would be a disaster and nobody wants to grade that. Yes. I mean, basically, they're going to give you some sample. You can probably start the, for them from that as your template. And then it's just the same thing you're always asked to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you're applying your legal knowledge. Right. There are going to be rules. They're going to be like facts. facts. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to put them together and you're going to answer some questions. You're going to answer some questions. So um, you just have to rely on your skill and do not panic. Easier said than done. Um, but sometimes, you know, before you move on to the two pieces of the performance test, or I guess three pieces of the performance test, um, I just want to say that sometimes these are really straightforward. I think that this gets lost on a lot of people. Like sometimes there are some crazy PTs, like you said, where it's just like people lose their minds. But I remember one of the performance tests on my bar was like an eight factor test. You're like, okay, great. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. (laughs) And I remember sitting in the room and like having written it. And I finished a little early. And back then in the stone age, it was three hours. Um, and so it was a really long performance test. So I, I finished early and I went back and I'm like, I must have missed the boat. Right. Like, like how I'm, could it be that straightforward? Like it couldn't have been an eight factor test. And so I like went back and I reread the task memo and then I went back through the library. And I was by the end, I was like, no, I think it's just an eight factor test. And it was. And some people went and either made it more complicated or changed their answer and ended up probably you know, pulling their score down because they just didn't accept it for what it was, which was something very direct. Yeah, I mean, I think the key thing too is they're not trying to trick you here. They just want to see, again, a basic level of competence. Can you can you accurately identify that this is an eight-factor test go through all the eight factors and that's all you need to do? I mean, I remember getting really lucky on one of them because the second one in California and the test I took was the exact same topic as what I had to write my moot court memo on. Mm. So there was that crazy moment of like, is this really? Yes, this is exactly (laughs) the same. I know these cases. Yeah, (laughs) I know. Okay, yeah. But then you mean, again, like you kind of have to back off and say, well, I know like, you know, what the law was in in moot court world. Right. But I don't know, you know, what they're asking me to do here. So I still had obviously to read everything, but definitely it helped. But that's a really good point is that some people can get tripped up because they assume they know what's in the library. And right. If it's like your area of expertise. Right. And you cannot assume it. You no. can't assume it. You got to see what they gave you because they really want you to use what they gave you, not your prior knowledge of the law. Yeah. And if it's an area you know well, I think there's a danger of overcomplicating it. Mm-hmm. All right, so we've referenced them a bit, but um, now that we've run through the four different types of PTs, let's run through uh, the components of the PT just in case anyone's really feeling like they need a little bit of a boost because they haven't had time to study this one. So the beauty is all PTs start with a task memo, which is the single most important document because it identifies the issues to be addressed or omitted and provides an overview of the facts. So basically it establishes the audience tone and organization of your product. It tells you what to do. Yeah, so this is kind of your Bible for the PT. Mm-hmm. The beauty is sometimes they'll even give you numbered lists. So like talk about these four things. They might make references to documents in the file. They might even give you background information on your client. I typically tell students to read this at least twice, um, sometimes twice and then come back to it again. Um, but you, this is really where you get the framework. So this is not one to skim. This is one to sit down and really, you know, own. Well, and you want to be looking for answers to those questions we talked about earlier. You know, you want to make sure you've identified who is the audience for this. Mm-hmm. What am I being asked to do? Yeah. You know, those basic type of things. Just take a take a few seconds, take a step back and say, mm-hmm. okay, you know, I'm, I'm writing a letter to my client. Okay. Right. Let me think for a second about what that means. Okay. I've got it. Yep. 
So then um, you have the library. And so, you know, this is the part that's really about all of the legal rules. This is pretty much your legal research. Now, there are different schools of thought. Do you read the library first? Do you read the file first, which is the facts? I am personally a file reader first, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but a lot of people are library readers. I think that uh, if you have time to try out both techniques, you need to see which one works with your brain better. But I will say that I want you to commit to one before you go into the test room, because what I do not want is you to start reading the library and then be like, oh, no, I should have read the facts. And then you go to the file and then you're like, oh, no. And then, you I mean, time is just. Like, time is ticking it, at that yeah, point. Yeah, you've like, yeah, you've yeah, set so the clock for me, on fire. I'm pretty sure I'm a library reader. That's not so surprising I'm, to me. Yeah, I'm like, you got to know the law. <laughs> like, how can I know what fa- these facts are not going to make any sense to me until I understand the I basic know. structure of the law? So I think you can make an argument either way. Because you can also make an argument like, well, with the facts, I know then what I'm looking for. Right. So I just like stories. I think I just like hearing the story first. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, so let's assume you're a library person. Um, this is where you really zoom into the legal rules. And I think one of the things that um, I want you to think about is. And I even tell students to sometimes do this is literally sometimes you have to sit on your hands and stop marking up the um, case until you get to the important part. Because one of the, we're such bad highlighters and marker uppers yeah. at this point. So you've got your marker, or your pen or your highlighter and you start highlighting every single word <laughs> or every single sentence when you're like, oh, this is case has all these facts. You don't even know why the case is in the packet yet. Yeah, I mean, my, my advice here would be, you know, Typically, take a step back, take a couple minutes to mm-hmm. like flip through the library and see what you've been given. You mm-hmm. know, do you have cases? Do you have statues? Right. Maybe there's a law review article. You might want to read them in a different order. You know, if they've given you a statute, that can be a really good place to at least get like a basic overview of what you're being asked to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if there's some type of article in there, that can also be a great place to at least get an overview. Yeah, before you dive into these individual cases because you don't even understand what they're about at this point. Right. Also, sometimes cases will explain statutes. So if you have statutes and you're just scratching your head because you don't understand how they fit together, I think sometimes the cases will explain that for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think you just want to kind of take a step back and see like, okay, what do I have here? And then maybe very briefly look at them and see what jumps out at you. Because you yep. know, you've already read the task memo. You have some idea of what you're being asked to do. Exactly. You know, So what's jumping out at you is probably like the most important place to start. Right. And then read that pretty carefully. Right. So if there is a statute, understand it's going to possibly have extraneous provisions. So you're not going to necessarily use every single thing in that statute. Um, and you know that it's an extraneous um, provision if it doesn't pertain to any of the issues you've been told to address in the task memo or in the cases. So that's okay, but don't ignore all like complete statutes. All I the mean, statutes are there for a reason. Yeah, they just might be part of the statute. That's <laughs> they not probably did not include statutes that you don't need to talk exactly, about. Exactly, because that would just be killing trees. Like they're not just yeah. going to print extra sheets of paper. Now, if you're given cases, you want to start looking for numbered lists of elements, references to precedent. Um, you might even see references to other cases in the library. So that'll help you um, see how the cases fit together um, and the interpretation of uh, an application of legal rules. So, you know, oftentimes this is where you'll be given the statute they're going to talk about in the case and they're going to show you a sample of the analysis you're likely going to have to do. So I like to look in the cases for examples of the analysis I'm being asked to do in my PT. Yeah. So once I've read the library, what should my takeaway be? Like, what am I looking for here? You are looking for the pieces of the puzzle and how those things fit together. So you need each piece of that um, that library has a purpose. Right. And your job is, and I literally write this down at the top of each section, whether it be a statute or whether it be a case, why is this in the library? Right. <laughs> what, why did they put this in here? Right. And if you cannot answer that question, then go back and read it again. Yeah. Um, or at least you know, flag it for yourself right. so that once you get into the facts or something, maybe it becomes more clear. Right. But you want to basically, I mean, you probably want to have a list basically of each ele- each of the things you've been given and answer that question. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, by the end of the library, you should have a pretty clear idea of how the law itself fits together. Mm-hmm. So that then if you haven't read the fact the file yet looking for the facts, you can then, you know, that's where you're going to get like your legal stuff, basically. Exactly. So when you move into the file, you want to look for facts that relate to each element of the rules you extracted from the library. 
And you um, have to be okay to let go of extraneous facts because there are going to be extra facts. Yeah. Typically not extra documents, but extra facts. Yeah, I mean, they may give you a whole section that's not really that relevant to anything. Right. I mean, especially when you see depositions, there's yeah. oftentimes like the whole first page of the deposition is like, what's your name? Right. How do you know the defendant? Yeah. What color shoes are you wearing? I mean, it really is there feels anything like... you've had today to drink right. or to eat that would like <laughs> impact your ability to answer these questions truthfully? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so you don't need to like be taking copious notes on that. Yeah, don't highlight that. No. So you're looking. Assume they said, no, I'm, I'm feeling pretty okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you want to look for facts that are similar similar or distinguishable from the facts in the library of cases. So that's why I said, you know, that oftentimes the library will give you an example of what sort of analysis you're going to do. You're going to start seeing facts that might be similar or different. So, for instance, uh, in my eight-factor PT when I sat for the bar, one of the things they were looking for was whether someone was in a custodial interrogation and there was this, like, eight-factor test. And so it's like, in one case, it was like the guy was detained for three hours and that was, you know, that was enough. But then our person was detained for eight hours. And so you're looking for those kind of um, comparison. So it gives you something to argue about. Right. Same but different. Same but different. So you're looking for that. Um, and you can't just in that case be like, well, three hours is the same as eight hours. So like, well, they're not the same. Right. And you need to think about why. And you how need to argue different. depending on where, <laughs> what your role is. You got to argue, you know, whether it's the same or the yeah, I mean, in a persuasive memo, you say, well, you know, the fact that our client was detained for eight hours versus three hours suggests X. Right. So um, you also want to look for consistencies and inconsistencies in the testimony and within the documents in the file. So maybe one party says sees things one way, one party sees things another way. You need to look for those because those are going to be probably things you need to distinguish in your answer as well. Yeah, I mean, you're basically looking, if we go back to like, you know, first year law school, we're looking for ambiguities. Right. Whether those are legal ambiguities or factual ambiguities or some combination thereof. Yep. So but, you know, hopefully this is stuff that you have been doing your entire law school career. This should not be completely novel to you. So just use those same skills and the techniques you've developed to do case analysis and all those other things and apply it to the PT. Yep. I think just keep in mind that this is a totally attainable part of the test to do. With a little bit of practice, a little bit of focus, you can gain what I consider easier points than other places. So yeah. practice it, get to know it. It's not to say that's not hard. It's just possible. Well, and I think a lot of times people's problems really come down to timing. Mm -hmm. And on that, I think it's just, you know, you've got to have a technique of making sure that you're not going to have to go back into the library or back into the files, you know, making note if you do like where things are, you know, if you think a fact is important, like note where it is in case you need to go look it up again, that kind of thing. Um, And just being really efficient as you go through, you know, I mean, I think it's problematic for people who just happen to be slower readers. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to kind of force yourself to skim a lot of this stuff um, without panicking, yep. <laughs> which is easier said than done. Easier said than done. If you are looking for some more practice on the uh, performance test, you can check out our Writing of the Week program where we use videos to walk you through um, real past MPTs. Uh, we go through all the different types so you can get kind of a sampling. And we also have our Brainy Barbank tool that is a database of these questions um, to practice all categorized by type. So you can uh, do as much practice as you'd like. But that's probably for people who aren't taking the bar in, you know, a matter of days. Yeah. Um, and I think in California, you know, the kind of wild cards are becoming a little bit less frequent just because you only have one of them. So you're probably more likely to see those on the UBE. But yeah. you never know. They can do whatever they want. They've only been doing this 90 minute performance test for a few cycles. So yeah. We don't so really know. Probably they're going to start coming up eventually. Yep. All right. Well, with that, we're out of time. Good luck on your performance test portion of your bar exam. I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at barexamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane as you study for the bar exam. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to support you as you study for the UBE or California bar exam. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you are still in law school, you might also like to check out our popular Law School Toolbox podcast as well. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at Lee at BarExamToolbox.com or Allison at BarExamToolbox.com or you can always contact us via our website contact form at BarExamToolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.